half man, half cactus in the desert. An undead high school quarterback. Ghost librarian in a liminal space library. A thought out caveman who is not even evil, just morbidly curious about what's under your skin. Evil train conductor on a train. What's your deal? Um... A sadistic elevator who kills you in all the ways an elevator can. I'm... My name is Turner Burton. And I make movies with Lucas. Sludge monster in a shopping mall. A murderous chimpanzee on an international flight. Our first objective was to dream up the perfect slasher movie premise. An eco-terrorist dolphin loose in a water park. A literal witch in a literal bog. Some ideas were too limiting, some ideas were too cliched, some ideas we had to throw out for simply requiring too much research. Like undead cyborg Richard Nixon who says, I am a crook, sounds cool until you realize that your movie is deeply intertwined with the political zeitgeist of the 1970s, which you know nothing about and don't have time to read up on because, you know, 48 hours. Turner and I needed an idea that didn't restrict us. We needed a setting that we could custom build to our liking, and we eventually found it. Okay, do you know, like Pirates of the Caribbean, right? Dark Ride. Yep. The Dark Ride version. I'm familiar. You ever been on it? No. So it's, it's, you're in a group of six in a log, and then you float on water through a made-up pirate town. That, but it breaks down, people are stuck in there overnight, the pirates come to life and start killing everybody. Oh, okay, all right. On a personal note, I want to write the movie about the the animatronics in the pirate ride coming alive and killing I think everybody. I, I like that because you have a setting and you can yeah. do anything with the setting. Very contained. And as they go on the original, like the tour, you can get to, you get to see all the locations on the pirate ride. And then once right. they get stuck, it's like they can all come back into play. And just like that, we had our premise. Well, kind of. What I'm not showing you is the hour we spent methodically whittling down our list of movie ideas. Turner and I recorded like eight hours of footage, and I thought that I could simply comb through it all and remove everything but the key moments. But it didn't take me long to realize that those key moments were not as clearly defined as I had thought. It turns out brainstorming is messy. Uh, it's easy to see why videos of this kind tend to be more about the process and less about the thing itself. Still though, I wanted to do both. So what you're about to see, disclaimer, is an abridged, supplemented, heavily edited account of how the boys wrote Ride or Die. Are we going pro growing up? Or are we going pro stay a child? I think it's just a conversation. After deciding on our pirate theme park premise, Turner and I entered the nebulous stage of creating our characters and defining our themes. Initially, we believed this would be a story about growing up. The dilemma of going out into the big, scary adult world versus holding on to the naive wonder of childhood. But you'll see how those themes evolve as we refine our characters. In keeping with the slasher genre, we knew we wanted a final girl, so we started with her. Nancy, Dawn, Rachel, Jessica, Charlie, Abra, Josephine, Christine, JC, Sarah, Lenora, Kachina, Natalie, and Gwyn are all female names that I have written. I like Natalie. I like Natalie. Her name's okay. Natalie. We also knew we wanted an obnoxious boyfriend character and we ended up calling him Reed. Reed is just wants to like cause some shit around. Yeah, I think he's like the filling his life with meaningless things to find meaning. Then we created three more kids to round out the group. Tim, Cass, and Gwen. Let's just say all of these characters are dealing with stress about what's next, right? Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, that they're all dealing with the same thing in different ways. So then Reed, Reed is just gonna mask his stress with just the constant hedonism and adventure. And since these kids were all going out into the world, we thought it would make sense for one of them to be really attached to the group. Uh, Gwen is probably f trying to fill the bubble with, if it, like fill, I mean, fill the void with other people. Right. So, so one, one is like, one, Gwen is like, come on guys, let's let's go into the future together. Don't leave yeah, yeah. me. Yeah, we're not, we're yeah, not, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we're yeah. not separating. That's good, yeah, that's yeah, good. Gwen wants everybody to stick together. The Tim character started as a pirate enthusiast modeled after Turner, then he became a history buff, then he ascended into more or less a nerd archetype. Tim strikes me as the kind of character that would embrace this. Well, embrace meaning what? 
Meaning, because that's kind of what he's got a plan lined up that he's excited about. I want him to. What's the darkness under that? You know. Okay, you want them all to have like. Yeah, yeah. I want. Yeah, I don't want. I don't want want healthy people in this story. I think Tim probably thinks that if he knows more than everybody, he will be better than everybody. Just take it in. Take it in. I have to make sense of this. I think type five. Tim. Tim wants to make sense of things. So Tim is the the one who's going to be the moment shit starts happening. Tim is theorizing about it. Cass was initially a young professional workaholic type, but she morphed into a punk rock girl. Like maybe she's trying, maybe she's one of those people who's trying to fight things all the time. Yeah. A person like that needs to learn how to be vulnerable. She's tough. She's a hard ass. We could do a tragic love story between Tim and Cass. Oh, that rocks. Someone like Tim, it's like, I need to... Like he's not ready yet. That's that's the five is like no 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 wait I need to I need to think about this more. Yeah. You know. Oh, she wants him to yeah she wants him to ask her. He's like no 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 I'm still planning out the perfect strategy. I can, yeah, uh, yeah yeah. And so Nat can be like or Gwen is probably like Tim, you're gonna ask out yeah, Cass yeah, yeah, and he's yeah, like yeah, yeah. no uh like or like what if this was gonna be the time like he had finally planned yes, the perfect date. Yes. This yeah. is the date. This is the this date. is the fucking date. Oh no way. I mean if Natalie is going to be the last one to survive, why do the other ones die? Because she 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 recognizes the problem. She recognizes that she's so afraid. they all have to be in denial. They all they all deny that they're afraid. Thanks. So I, they at at their deaths one by one, they all, all have to be, they all have to be, be presented yes. with the situation where they could grow exactly. and not and they except don't. for Natalie. Yeah, Natalie. It's, she finally gets it at the end. If Natalie's thing is that she wants she wants a system. She wants people to tell her this is the way. She this wants is to be told path. what to do. Well, her being the last one left by default means she's. There's no one left to done, tell her what to do. To what to yeah, do. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Natalie likes when the, the plan is laid out and people tell her, "This is the way things are," and she goes, "Oh, nice, yay." We also decided that there should be a 90-year-old lady on the pirate ride too, just as an additional variable. It, like it's like a group of five kids, and then they get saddled with like an old lady who's like a huge fan of like the ride like loves it loves it and she's okay. like she's like the grogu she's like the she's like the baby they have to take care of cuz she's like 90 <laughs> and she went, she's she so, like in an instruction she barely even knows where she is yeah she doesn't she's just i love the pirates she's like me but if i were a 90 year old woman she's like i yeah. love pirates and then it turns out that she's like the wife of the theme park owner or something oh and she you know just I mean? goes on the ride like every day like the only thing she's capable of speaking is like pirate lore about the ride yard this be where we be buried the treasure you know what i mean and it's right. Actually, like, oh, then the halfway through, is. they realize, yeah, no, they realize, like, she's actually, like, spinning yes. bars. She's actually, like, saying clues. Ethel. Gotta be. Are you saying, I don't know about Ethel. Gotta be Ethel. Why is it, I don't know about Ethel. Okay, who, other old lady names. Or, like, it could be something cute, like Annie. Because that's, like, Anne Bonnie. Or, like, Bonnie. I like Bonnie. Oh, Bonnie's it's the Bonnie. one. It's gotta be Bonnie. It's Bonnie. When we got to the question of the pirate slasher villain, we decided that there should just be one and that he should be a wax figure, and that he should somehow be possessed by the deceased creator of the ride. This one has like the, the skeleton of the owner. And then the lady has been saying something the whole time. That's like, and yeah. And then they're like, wait, wait, say that again. The old man's oh, bones are man. shaking. He put his bone in that. He put his bone in what? He, and they're like, all right, lady, he's putting <laughs> his bone in what? Can we do that? Yeah, yeah. My husband put, put his, his bone, bone in that. He put his it, bone It's like in a that. femur, you know, and it's like, that's like the bone. It's like a magic femur. <laughs> it's a magic femur. <laughs> Can we, is that the bit? Is it he put his magic, magic femur, femur into the animatronic and it comes to life and kills people? After much deliberation, we decided to call him Captain Crowbones. His deal is that he wants to force you to have fun and indulge his twisted pirate fantasy. By this point, about two hours into the workshop, we were fully in outlining mode. We nailed down a few basic things. Act one, the kids arrive at the park, they make their way to the ride, and they get trapped in there along with Bonnie. Act two, Captain Crowbones hunts the kids down one by one as they try to escape, and also kills Bonnie in a moment that reveals his true nature as the undead Cornelius Cobb. And act three, Natalie finally embraces her inner pirate and faces off against the Wax Captain. We also knew that a map of the ride would be extremely important. So we drew one up. Once you board the boat, this giant gate opens and you float into the darkness. The first segment of the ride is the grotto, a small picturesque cave. There are skeletons everywhere and at the far end of the grotto is the fountain of youth emanating blue light. Then you go through a tunnel and you enter the next section, 
the town. Tropical music plays as you drift past straw cabanas full of wax pirates drinking, playing cards. Every five minutes, an animatronic parrot remarks, these be dangerous waters. Then the boat turns the corner and you find yourself in the Palms area. It's much more claustrophobic, dense jungle, and then boom, a light turns on, revealing Captain Crowbones in all his waxy glory. He taunts you as you drift by into the next section, the storm. It's kind of underwhelming. The air blowing out of the vents smells like someone left deviled eggs in there 10 years ago. Then you come out of the storm, you find yourself in the open water in the middle of a pirate battle. <laughs> Fake cannons, you know, two ships, and then you, you drift between them. Finally, you face off against the Kraken with its clunky moving tentacles. Helpless to escape, you're sucked into the Kraken's mouth deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the gate opens, the ride is over. So Turner and I had our characters. We had a mostly solid plot and we had our setting. But when day two arrived, it was time to get microscopic. It was time for sticky notes. We came up with this while we were outlining a story in our freshman year dorm lobby. It's very simple. First, you assign each character a different color sticky note. Sticky note. And you find a nice big wall. Divide the wall into imaginary columns. From left to right, each column is a scene. If a character is present in the scene, you put their sticky note in that column. And on that sticky note, you write what they're doing, thinking, or feeling in the scene. For every scene? For every scene. Oh my god. Until you're done. Sticky note. Don't you see? I think I do. For every scene, uh, it's so much fun. Yes. I found that this works for two reasons. Number one, it forces me to think about scenes. If you're writing a book, you're allowed to float into abstract tangents that aren't directly tied to the story timeline. But in a movie, everything that happens must happen in a scene. A contained period of time in a specific location with specific characters. You need to get in the habit of thinking in terms of scenes, not key moments connected by vibes, scenes. The second reason I find the sticky note method helpful is that it forces me to check in on each character. You might already know what red is doing in scene three, but green is also there. So is green just standing there doing nothing? Well, no, I gotta write something on the damn sticky note. So I have to think. What would Green do in this scene? How is this scene meaningful to Green? What would Green think about this? What would Green feel about this? You know what I'm saying? You picking up what I'm putting down? And the result of this is an upgraded outline that squeezes all of the juice out of each character. Anyways, Turner and I decided to use the sticky note method for this movie. So this is our scene one. What is scene one and where is it? I, th I think it should be on the car, in the car on the way there. I was thinking that they were like all stratified across the park. No, I- Cause then you see them all on their own before they interact together. But what does that mean? Why would they all be- Oh, by the way, it's like 15 straight minutes of sticky noting. I think this section is pretty cool. I think it's my greatest achievement as an editor, seeing as it used to be three and a half hours, but it's still a lot. So if you just want to skip to the quick and dirty plot recap, go to this timestamp. It could be that Reed, Nat, and, and Gwen are all together already in the park waiting on Tim and Kaz and, and we meet. So the first scene is really just these three, but we follow, yeah. we, it's through Gwen's perspective. As she is, you know, feeling excluded from Reed and that and trying to figure out where Cass and Tim are, but they're just running late because. Right, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. I like that. Um, and then do we get a scene with them in the car or do they just show up? I think we could get a scene with them in the car, but that would have to be, what is that about? I think either way Cass is driving, maybe Cass is driving really fast. It's an easy way to show like how he reacts to her because is yeah. he gonna call her out on it? Is he gonna get mad? He probably really wants to, okay. but he's like, like, and we just see it in his face. It's, yeah. it's like a dashboard shot looking at the two of them. And she's like pissed off about something, right? And he's just agreeing, trying not to freak out about the fact that she's speeding. And then we have a phone call intercutting between the three at the park and the three in the parking lot. And then Cass like donuts into the parking lot and then boom, it's our five together. Yeah. Okay, I like that. Then they go in. So what do they all do once they're in the park? What do each of these five characters do 
in a in not abandoned, but in a run like in, in like a mall of America type situation. Or like a Tri-County Mall, or like any of the malls except Kenwood. Uh, Gwen wants them all to go do something together. Maybe she wants a picture. There's a photo booth. Everybody's oh, gonna no, have she to wants pay. a photo, but it's a ridiculous price. And then Cass is like, fuck that, I'm not doing that. But they all have other ideas of what they want. Reed has an idea and Nat, Nat is gonna back him up on. I think it, we need to show very early on that Nat is gonna go along with the plan, right? So even before the ride stuff, what can, what can be a microcosm of this, of this relationship here? And Reed is like, dog, I want like a hot dog. Maybe the ride is not, I like that the idea that the ride is not part of Tim's plan. Cause we brought that yeah, up yesterday. Yeah, 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 yeah. The ride is a derailment. He is here. Oh, what if they have like a museum there of like, of, of history of the park, right? It's like one of yeah. those, like the history of Corny's Island. And so Tim being the history nerd thinks that that would be a really romantic gesture to like take people there. I like the idea that this was Tim's idea and he asked Cass and mm. Cass and Reed are good friends. And, and she invited him. And she invited him, him and Tim is like, you know? Yeah. And he can't even be mad about it. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go to the pumpkin patch. We're gonna carve pumpkins. We're gonna eat dinner. We're gonna go to the museum of the, of the place because I love history and he's not even thinking about what anybody else right, wants. Yeah, and then yeah. we're gonna see the fireworks. Reed gets there, he, he's not even in the mess. He's just like, I'm hungry now, I want a hot dog. Yeah. And then Cass is like, yeah, hot dog. Tim doesn't want a hot dog. And he's like, well, fine, you guys get your hot dog. I'm gonna go over to the I'm museum. I'm going to the fucking museum. Okay, so, oh, Gwen agrees to go with him okay, because so she, doesn't want him, she doesn't want anybody to be alone, which means she then goes and, and, and she can have a nice little scene with Tim. With Tim about- And she's asking about Cass, that's perfect. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So now, now Tim case. and Gwen are having a conversation about the relationships and in the background, we're hearing an announcer go, in 1943. Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Because yeah. then it, we get a little Pope in the pool action. So we can cut between the hot dog scene and the museum scene. The hot dog scene should be, have you guys heard about Corny's Cove? Yeah, yeah. The, the ultimate. And then when Tim gets back, his plan is even more derailed. Yeah, and then he gets back <laughs> and made a whole and, new plan. And he's like, okay, so we're, so now can we go to pumpkins? And, he, and Reed is like, dude. New plan. New plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, Reed didn't know oh, about yeah. it. It was a creepy hot dog vendor. He's like, oh, oh heard about yes, that. there's gotta be a creepy hot dog vendor. Oh, I love that, yeah. Okay, so That's there, my cameo. So Tim hates it, but they go anyway. And now they're in line for the ride. Cass is down for the ride. Nat is down for the ride. What I'm thinking is, so Tim is, is pissed it's not in the plan. He's telling, Rhett, he's telling Nat we can still, yep. I mean, it's telling Cass we can still make it. Gwen, meanwhile, now they're getting in the boat. They see that there's only six, there's six slots, there's only five of them. Gwen immediately is like, Nat, Nat, I have, like, let's sit together. So they sit together. Like Gwen, like, insists that she sits with Nat. She's, it's one of those obsessive friendships. Cass and Tim end up together, and then Reed is in the back alone. And that's when they're like, oh, you guys only have five. Can we get a single rider? And in hobbles Bonnie, and she's, like, babbling. <laughs> and she sits next to Reed. Bonnie! She's iconic. She is iconic. She is the moment. I've always, I've I always- I think Reed would, like, kind of hit on her. Like he would do some joke. What's up, baby? <laughs> yeah, what's up, baby? What's up, baby? <laughs> we need we need like the first clue. This is like the first clue that something is awry. What is she saying? And she why is she? saying she's trying to. I think she's trying to express that she's excited to say to see her husband. Right, but what's a creepy way to say I'm excited to see my dead husband? They it's put some... skin on him. They gave him new skin. <laughs> They took him out of the bin. They gave him a new skin. She smells the air from the park as the door opens up. I always lust when I smell the must. <laughs> and he's yeah. like, I bought a new cologne. <laughs> he's like, like, you know, yeah. like that's yeah. Dior Fahrenheit, baby. <laughs> and then I, we, we, I want to show the cast makes an effort to sit next to uh, Tim? Tim. Yeah, because I want to show that oh, she Reed, actually does like, like him. This is a sequence about Reed in which he tries to sit with Nat and then Gwen steals Nat. And it's Nat, just a funny little and Chinese then, fire And then he drill. goes back. <laughs> Getting on the ride, and then does it creak into motion? This scene, this next post-it note is going to be the ride, and it's a ride, what yeah. each of them do. Right, right. Tim is skeptical yeah. about the fountain of youth. Tim, Tim's like, that's huh. not the real one. <laughs> that is not the real fountain. And then I want Nat to say something about the ship battle, because that's where she's going to kill Crowbones in the end. 
She's like, that looks intense. I don't know if I could do it kind of thing. You yeah, know? something like, oh my God. Like, that's like, this is really intense. And Gwen's yeah. like, you know, if they had just like talked it out. So. Cass makes fun of crow bones. Mm. Reed is. And then Reed is. I think he's like doing a bit of role playing. He's like, I'm the captain. I'm the. Blah, blah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the magic stops the ride. So they get to the crack and attack and the tentacles suck. And then, and then that is when they're all like, oh my God. It's just like a car wash thing. Goes, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the ride stops. They get out of the ride. Tim would be the one to be like, well, guys, you know, if we just wait here, they'll show up. You know, like people are going to come to fix no, the ride. No, that's, that's Nat because we're hinting at the fact that this is magic. Yeah, that, right? this, yeah. So Tim's gut reaction to this is this doesn't make sense. If the power was off, then, then why, why would just the rail power be off, you know? Cass is like, no one's going to help you. you got to help yourself. It's like we've just developed a little friend group that we're hanging out. I know, right? <laughs> Gwen is just getting anxious that everybody is splitting up and like, wait, yeah. no cast come back. Yeah. Reed is kind of disappointed and he's just splashing around like, well, mm. I guess we can make our own fun. Hide How and do we? Seek. And now it's hide and seek. It's the first and, real horror and, sequence. Yeah. Th these are these are fake out jump scares. But how can we wring more character out of this? How do each of our characters interpret this hide and seek game? I think Cass is like, I'm gonna beat you at hide and seek, you motherfucker. Uh, yeah, I is it Gwen? Is Gwen seeking? Or is it more powerful for her character that she is hiding and leaves the hiding spot because she doesn't like being alone? Ooh, I like that. I think it would be really cool to make Nat the one seeking then because it puts her in an early position of agency where she is not good at. I think Tim has the best hiding spot because he's very meticulous about it. Okay, but I want him to come out at the end like, ah, I won. You know? Yeah, but I think that that should be because he figured out a crucial location for yes, later. Yes, yes. Cass just goes to the ship from earlier because she thought it was cool. And then she hides in the ship, finds the source of fire. I think it's like the yeah. cannons have a real fire mechanism. Because it was made in like the 50s and it, it's not up to code at all. Reed right? is just bored. Fake, fake jump scare. Yeah, yeah. He gets jump, bored. He and is fake, bored and yeah. he has, he's going to fake jump scare. Yeah, yeah. He's like, man, this is not as fun as I thought it was going to be. He, this dude is ADD, yeah. for sure. Matt just notices, hey, wasn't the pirate guy? Oh, and Reed jumps out. Ah, yeah, so that's nervous. it, that's it. Because she sees he's not there, and then Reed jumps out, and she forgets about it immediately. Oh, he <laughs> definitely wants to make out in the pirate ride. Oh, he does. Oh, he does. He, so he wants to make wants out. To, I, I think they're like, let's kiss on the pirate ride, and they go to the pirate ship, and they find her. Find who? Find Cass, and then... And then Cat, no, they're kissing, and Cass is like, like sitting there like... Really, guys? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, She's yeah, like yeah. eating her hot dog from earlier. Like, <laughs> really, you motherfuckers? Uh, so, so now the three of them are reunited, and then that gives Tim the opportunity to be like, I won. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's it, that's it. And that's they're it. like, no, we didn't. We didn't find Gwen. We, I, I really want to explore the aftermath of Gwen's death, right? That's, that's very important. Right, so now they're, they're trying to look for her. They find a body. Well, Crowbones, he starts out like he wants to send a warning. Right? Yeah. At, at first, he's like, hey, start having fun. Cass is like, oh, I'm gonna, whoever did this, like, I'm gonna fuck him up, right? Yeah. And then Reed could find the body. This type seven energy is like, the moment shit gets real, they I'm become out. avoidant. Right. Right? But he, okay. yeah, he's gonna shut down. It's a total personality 180. So he should happens. be the one to find Gwen. Yeah. Yes. So Nat is gonna attach the, like, yeah. She, well, Reed, what do we do? And Reed mm -hmm. is just, Cass, what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know? Makes sense. And what does Cass want to do? I want to kill him. I want to kill him. And Tim is like, no, you, no, we need to get out of here. Well, they don't know who's doing it. They don't, they don't know how she died yet. Right. They're, they're, it's going to be a whole process of figuring that out. Right. So, so they're like, would, I, would they blame each other? No, no. They, they might, though, because think about it. I think it. they blame Bonnie. Sh Cass wants yeah. to find who to blame. They're like, well, you got muscles under there. You're hiding some, like, Matt advocates for Bonnie. Reed right, is just frozen from. the entire time. Tim is the voice of reason. Guys, we have to get out. Yeah. Well, they also might think that it was an accident that she died. They probably want This is where they try to contact the outside world and nothing is Oh, working. right. Tim's going to try that first. Yeah, that's probably going to be his first right. move. Or they, after, he hears some pirate shit on the line. But we are now in a new part of the story in which we are trying to get, get out. out. Now that the phone call has, has turned Cass out Cass wants to fight, but the rest of them, yeah, let's yeah, get out. Yeah. Reed's like, yeah, let's go. So... They're trying to get out. Now we can have a new batch of character pairings or scenes or... Right, right. This is, this is a new batch of these until Reed's death. I think we give them some plan and we have it not work. Okay, so call, this, this call is Tim's work. time to shine. He's like, this okay, is Tim's guys, time to shine. let me, I, I will figure this out. Just, Tim give is a me, just give me time. And Cass thinks it's kind of hot how Tim is figuring things out. And he's like taking control. And she's like, aw. 
you know, Reed's issue yeah. is that he's just on the go, on the go, on the go, because he doesn't want to look back. And I actually, I'm well, going to so do something. So when Tim and Cass try and take charge, he would fight them on that. He'd be like, you guys are overreacting. It was an accident. If yes, we just yeah, he's in denial. He's in denial. It's an accident. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm going to go to the, I will pry that door open myself. And he storms off and he goes to pry open the door. So, so Nat is saying, like, the final maybe, Nat yeah. and Reed scene is Reed failing to understand his problem. Yep, and then he tries to pry open the door, Crowbones attacks, Nat gets away, Reed dies, now we're in deep shit. Crowbones could kind of have Nat cornered, right? And then Bonnie's like, my love, come to the waterfall, you know? And then Nat, Nat watches from afar, and then it's the, the kill of yeah. Bonnie. And this is like the first time we see the murder like in a wide shot. Right. Like with Gwen, it was a little more mysterious. But now it's like, all right, this is a pirate guy with a sword. After Bonnie's death, they're going to start playing. They're going to start piecing it together. I want them to be sitting at like a little in a little thatch hut in the village or something. Yeah. And there's like like a funny little tropical music thing playing. That is funny. You know, and there's yeah. like a parrot there or some shit. And they're <laughs> and they're whispering. And they're like, OK, so I, I saw him. The old lady what was her name. Bonnie, Bonnie. Yeah, Bonnie. Um, she like walked up to him and. She, she called him Corny. Corny, isn't that the, the owner of the park? Like, this is that, we're, we're finally giving the audience some answers. Is yeah, right after yeah, Bonnie dies. Yeah, Nat is recounting Bonnie's death. Can't bear to talk about Reed though, right? Can't bear to talk about Reed. So now, now the cat's out of the bag. So these three are fully aware that there is this pirate after them. Tim is spiraling because he just can't make sense of it. Oh. Um, and Tim is like, well, if we if we understand it, we can we can. No, no. It. Tim literally just wants to understand it. I I so, have a hard time buying that knowing that a murderous pirate is on the loose wouldn't spur him into fight or flight. No, no. He still wants to get out on paper, but there's a little voice in the back of his head that really, really wants. This to is something I'm always yapping about, and most people don't agree with it. But I don't think life or death stakes are enough for a story. For one. Everybody wants to survive. So outside of very specific thematic cases, it doesn't say much about a character that they don't want to die. I know most people will say, oh, so you just flesh out your characters and you make them sympathetic and then you put them in peril so that the audience cares. And I'm like, yeah, sure, kind of. But even then, I, I think there's something so cheap about building up a character through characterization, through meaningful choices, and then in the 11th hour, deciding that whether they live or die is going to hinge on how fast they can run or how well they can do fight moves. Like, you see the disconnect here, right? People always said early Game of Thrones was so good because anyone could die. Um, but I think that misrepresents it. The show didn't just build up a cast of great characters and then decide to kill one at random every episode. No, they died because of their choices. They died because of their failings as people. And this is why I think so many horror scripts just don't work for me. They act like putting the characters in peril is enough, but they don't connect the character to the peril emotionally or philosophically. And I just think that's a missed opportunity. In Talk To Me, for instance, the antagonistic force feeds off of the character's insecurity and need for connection. And it just is woven so effortlessly into the story's themes. It's drama. It's well-written drama through a spooky filter. Whereas your average B-horror movie is just like, okay, here's a girl, she has a few personality traits, and now she's being chased by an evil clown. And no matter how atmospheric, how viscerally frightening it is, it just doesn't work for me in the way that solid character work does. Yeah, when you're in a life or death situation, all other agendas get put on the back burner. I get that. But I still wanna ground everything in drama because that's the reason I write. So I'm gonna be looking for ways that the character's traits can color their thoughts on survival and the choices they make in order to survive and uh, ultimately whether or not they do. Cass is just like, you know, let's fuck them up. Tim is like, wait, 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 plan. Mm -hmm. And Cass is like, okay, why don't we like create a plan to fuck him up? Do your plan, plan man. And Tim's like, oh, okay, Nat, right, I sure. think that should be Nat's idea. Why don't we create a why, plan why, oh, yeah, why to don't fuck we... him up? The, so is it's like, not that yeah. she latches onto Tim, it's that she, she finds she a harmonious mediates. solution. Yeah, she mediates. 
and I, this is, I think I want this moment with Tim and Cass where he, he makes a move on her and she pulls away because she can't handle vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I want that to happen here-ish. So the plan has to be foiled by the magicness. Yes, so he- The plan has to be otherwise- Oh, it, I'm it, gonna lop off his head, but he can operate without a head. Oh, uh, he picks it up. Oh, and he melts the wax of the head back somehow. On. And he, boink. That and rocks. There's that, like that, fire that is, on the That ride. is so indisputably supernatural. And then, and Tim freezes and he gets slashed up. I think Tim should get cut straight down the middle. <laughs> I like that they're setting up the oil thing together and then it's up to Nat to actually do it. Oh, maybe Cass blows it. Like they're setting up the oil trap and they're like, oh my God, there he is. And she's like- She blows it because she has to. Okay, she I, has like to, that. I like yeah, that, I like that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're setting it up and he's like lurking about the ship Yeah. and she charges him and he just like I love that, slices yeah. her and throws her overboard and Cass and, and Nat is like, holy fuck. So now this is the proper break into three. three. The yep. finale. This is the finale. The I want her to have a moment where she personally gets her shit together. It's like Arnold and Predator. The five elements of a scene involve an inciting incident, a complication of the incident. What am I doing? An inciting incident and a complication of an incident, uh, the panic mode, the climax and then how it ends up. So you just want to create more problems for her to right. pad this out and make it a more exciting finale. It's a gauntlet. It's it's okay, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a sequence. I'm with that. The lighter is waterlogged? Yeah, yeah. She's it's gonna be the the, the oh. way it's gonna be, pirate creeping up behind her slowly, slowly, slowly. He's on the boat and the boat is getting closer because he controls the boat. He's like this. She's in the water. She's trying to get the lighter to work. Come on, 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 come on. And there's oil all around her. Pirates closing in. Uh, finally, she finally lights it. And then boom, everything on fire. He's laughing, yes, but, he, but he's also melting. I think she thinks, oh, it's a fake out death. It's like a Terminator fake out oh, death. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's a fake out death for real. Uh, Not a death. Is that he's <laughs> actually so much cooler now. <laughs> is that he's just a skeleton now, yeah. And, and I think he, he kind of respects her metal. It's like at this point, it's yeah. almost like it doesn't matter who. It's like it's like Rocky. It's like yeah. he, she's given it all she has, and yeah. that's what matters. It's yeah. not about who wins. No. It's not about skill. So, it's about the fact that she's putting her balls into this. She's fully let go of all that shit, and now she is just cackling like an absolute menace with this pirate sword. This shit ain't nothing to me, man. There's nothing left for her to do but get out and maybe kill the bad guy on her way out. If she escapes through a, a through burning wreckage and he refuses to follow because no, no, that, because that, that's he, a brilliant idea. I love that. Because he, Cuz he can't leave the fantasy land. He well he refuses, but she leaves it. Yeah, you know okay. what I mean? All right. That no, that's that's, makes that's sense. the answer. I love that. I like what if the hot dog vendor comes up and is like, "Did you find the treasure?" <laughs> I, or like, "I see you Did found you have it. a good time?" It's <laughs> yeah. Remember, you can't put a bounty on fun or whatever. Okay, that's a movie. That's a movie. <laughs> Shit. They're about to be here. Voila, synopsis. Moving on. As long as we have a draft. We have, yeah, as long as we have, I mean, like- As long as we have a draft by tomorrow night. <clears throat> it is Wednesday. We were huh? supposed to have done a movie by now. About 24 hours ago, um, I find out I have a fever to go with uh, body aches and I'm getting sick and I haven't gotten out of bed all day. I did manage to get 11 pages. So I've sent those to Lucas. Hopefully he can make something out of them. No, honestly, the moment Turner told me he had the flu, I was like, oh word, what if we made it like a week long challenge? Uh, and so that's what it became. I was responsible for the first half, everything up until Bonnie's death. I'm not gonna dive into the specific choices we made during the drafting process since the plan was already laid out so thoroughly and we didn't deviate from it, but it is worth mentioning that Turner and I have slightly different styles. He uses placeholders on the document, I don't, 
In general, he likes to implement microsystems within individual scenes. The five elements of a scene. Whereas I basically go full intuition mode and my eyes glaze over. In my opinion, his dialogue reads a bit faster than mine. We have different voices, which is hard to quantify, but nonetheless very perceptible. I don't know. The draft is linked down below. See for yourself after you finish the video. And I guess since I'm filling a five day jump here, I can go a little further. If you've been subscribed to my channel for a while, you probably knew this video wasn't going to be overly concerned with what makes a good horror movie. I'm one of those people who sees genre as basically a coat of paint. I'm not a movie buff. I'm not AMC Nicole Kidman. I don't really have an emotional stake in the beautiful tradition of cinema or whatever. My advice to anyone writing in any genre is going to be about the same. Consistent characters, setups, payoffs, internal logic, themes, and then once you have all of that figured out, you can worry about engaging the audience on an aesthetic level. I doubt that I'm ever going to have some esoteric emotional truth bomb to drop on this channel. My theory is a reductionist one. I mean, all theories are, but mine is really reductionist. And it does make everything feel kind of samey and procedural at times. And I can see how that would suck the joy out of writing for some folks. But it's still my favorite thing ever. And hopefully it's what allows me to be of use to such a diverse audience of storytellers such as yourselves. That being said, it makes more sense to give certain stories a horror code of paint than it does others. I think there's a reason so many horror movies tend to be about broken, traumatized people. If you have darkness in yourself that poses a very real threat to you and the people around you, it's not too much of a leap to extrapolate that darkness into an external supernatural threat. Horror tends to suit themes of unaddressed traumatic experiences, uncertainty, karmic justice, or in our case, coping with fear. But I don't think there are any themes that bar you from taking a horror angle. Talk To Me's Type 2 themes are very uncommon in horror, and I think that's why it was such a breath of fresh air to me. Our movie is a relatively simple slasher with familiar ideas behind it, but if you're trying to think up a truly original, groundbreaking horror premise, I would say start with themes. What is horror never about? Imagine a horror movie centered on masochism, or laziness, or performative self-image, or perfectionism. Once I realized that horror was a matter of execution, and not something inherently part of a story's DNA, it felt very freeing to me. But the biggest danger in horror, I think, is that the genre gets used as an excuse to turn in mediocre work. If you're not concerned with all this character plot theme stuff, and you're just going for a gory, enjoyable movie, knock yourself out. I'm not here to critique other people's work. I think if you can't drink 10 to 14 beers and watch Terrifier 2 with the boys, you ain't living. My theory exclusively pertains to creation, not consumption. It's not a grading system. All I'm saying is that in my dojo, horror doesn't get a stupid pass just because it's horror. You still gotta put in the work. Sensible characters gotta act sensibly. Since I know people are going to ask, my favorites would have to be The Descent, Hereditary, Alien, The Thing, The Blair Witch Project, and Donnie Darko, if you count it. Turner's, actually, I've been talking for too long. I'm going to let him tell you. I really love Halloween. Um, I think Hereditary is legitimately very scary. And if I had to pick a third, I, I don't even have a top three of horror movies. Funny story, I was not that into horror as a child like and for the first like 17 years of my life i really did not like horror movies all that much uh to the point where my sister who's three years younger than me and my parents would watch them together and be like you want to join i'd be like no i don't like being scared and then some more time around the pandemic time when i was 18 i started loving them i think because i really like the 80s as an aesthetic uh, and then that is so intertwined with like the slasher and the horror genre that I got really into them. And now I love them. Anyways, I drove to my parents' house on Friday and I kept grinding despite an ominous scratching in my throat. Turner's fever broke. We both finished our halves and Saturday evening with 30 hours left on the clock, we stuck them together. I have chills. Like I have this sort of chills where like if I touch my body, it feels weird. You have what I had. It's the flu. I have had every flu symptom in the book. If I got and the flu, then I guess I'll fly. Are. The 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 tense on that doesn't, but I'll let it slide. Uh, okay, so first order of business: Can it be called ride or die? Yeah, no, I I, I agree with that. I think that's awesome. <laughs> um, that's that's an awesome title. It's not even like, it's not piratey, but it covers the fact that it's a ride. It covers the fact that it's 
partially about relationships. Um, and it has die in it, which is like very slasher. I think oh, it's yeah. the, the best we're going to get by a long shot. During this meeting, Turner picked apart my half. I picked apart his half, but we agreed that the thing was simply too short. And it's 66 pages, which sucks. I don't want to be at 66 pages. I just watched the 2009 Friday the 13th, uh, like reboot slash sequel that they did that Michael Bay helped produce. And it's not that bad of a movie. It's not great, but it's not that bad of a movie. And something that they did was they have a full 20 to 30 minutes at the beginning. It's like 20 minutes. It's like a full 20 minute sequence at the beginning that is essentially a short film with five characters. And then the the there's one girl that gets captured by Jason at the end of that 20 minutes that ends up like playing a role in like the rest of the movie. So I'm wondering if idea, I'm just riffing. What if we put in at the beginning of the movie a scene that takes place like back when that, that like shows how crow bones ended up as crow bones, but we don't realize that that's what we're seeing. Like some, or some kind of scene that takes place in like the fifties when the ride is brand new or so, you know, like the first kill we do, we need like, we need like a, a chunk at the, at the beginning. With one day remaining, Turner took on the task of creating a prologue to introduce the villain and get our page count up to a respectable level. <laughs> Meanwhile, I went through the existing pages and made all of the edits we agreed on. On Sunday night, exactly one week after our initial brainstorming session, Turner sent me his prologue, I tacked it onto the front, and that was it. Our 86 page first draft. tell you the truth i have no idea what i was writing here <laughs> it could use like a character pass of injecting yeah no i think so too character into it needs save the cat moments not in the sense of show that the character is good but in the sense of like are. show what they're all about yeah. you know which like, we have some opportunities right right, right. But i see i was just doing it all through dialogue we got to do a meat pass we got to do a meat pass i I don't know. I just got to get through finals, but I'm definitely going to stay on this. I don't know how involved you want to be with it, but I was thinking about going through and doing, I did this with mega racer, um, where I took the original script and just like turned it. Yeah. That's it all that's, in my voice. Basically. It's pretty common to translate it. Even if it's not getting the job done, I'm, I'm proud of the dialogue itself. This is very, this is very me, but I never know how that comes across to other people, you know? Yeah. Cause it's my rhythm. Um, and then mine is my, it's a, it's, it would need like a couple passes of the both of us in order to I think, feel consistent. Yeah. Yeah. And when we can get to a point where we can point to a line and say, why is that line there? What's that saying? What, then, then we're like, all right, yeah, we're really deep into it. Oh, the other big weak spot is definitely Bonnie. I'm like, yeah, cause it was all the Bonnie stuff was, was my stuff. And I was like doing it and I'm like realizing she's just a bunch of, a bunch of quips and then a revelation and then she dies. That's I why I really feel character. like she needs that scene with Nat. Wait, but what is that? Uh, mentorship, her giving life experience, probably some kind but, of. So then, yeah, that's hint. what I'm saying. Bonnie needs to be a character. So what yeah. specifically does Bonnie have? To be Few know this, but sometimes movies get made, and I may or may not have created a petition to gauge interest. If you mess with ride or die, if you'd be interested in seeing it happen. There is a link down yinder. If you're really, really bored and you want to see the uncut eight hour version of this video, it is available over on my Patreon along with... I sincerely hope you enjoyed the video. This was my fourth feature and Turner's first. Uh, we're both graduating in December, so it was good to write something together while it's still convenient. As always, thank you for your continued enthusiasm and support of this channel. I can't believe I get to do this. Happy holidays, happy writing, and I'll catch you on the high seas. We're gonna have to do another, we wrote a movie in one week. We're gonna have to do a sequel. <laughs> we wrote a, another a second draft in one year. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got it. we're gonna have a lot more time here soon. Yeah, it's gonna be crazy. There's a little ball. I don't like the way hey, that feels. That? That's a clown nose.
Get that out of here. No way. Is it really? Nice. <laughs> Good to have that, you know, just uh, at the ready. Yeah, I'll whip that one out. In case, <laughs> in case, least expect. In case the function is not silly. Yeah.